Cool. Hopefully you can all see my screen. All right. Um, so I'm presenting for the um, breed comparison team today, sort of in Dr. Estelle's uh, spot. And I'll mostly just be talking about uh, some of the progress we've made over the last year, um, particularly at the college ranch. And then I'll kind of fill in, you know, some of the stuff that's happening in Clayton as well. Um, so here's our um, four study sites at the college ranch, which is uh, as most of you know, about 30 miles north of, uh, or not even north of Las Cruces. Um, and so these are uh, four long-term pastures that we've been monitoring for almost 30 years. And so um, we've, we've been able to map the uh, ecological uh, states and sites um, so that we can look at cattle use um, as it relates to all different vegetation use through time. Um, and so Earlier this spring, as most of you know, we were successful in deploying our um, LoRaWAN um, GPS tracking system. And so we were able to track about uh, 42 cows over the course of almost four months um, from March, March into June. And so here in the bottom right corner, you can see some of our uh, Roramari Criollo girls with their GPS collars on. And here you can see how they were um, stratified across the different uh, sample pastures. And so the little uh, GPS locations there are individual fixes, um, basically 15 minutes to a half hour intervals um, of all the different cows over that entire uh, three, three to four month period. And uh, basically each one of these pastures is about 2,500 acres in size. So the whole study area is about 10,000 acres. So it gives you a little bit of uh, uh, understanding of the, you know, the magnitude of the landscape that we're looking at. Um, and so over the last couple of years, we've been monitoring the vegetation um, annually, both for uh, production uh, in biomass, uh, as well as the percent cover. So, so we're collecting line point intercept data, uh, as well as several other types of um, vegetation uh, monitoring, which is occurring. But basically, this is the, the this illustration is just to show you that we have some baseline information and some of our data from this year is starting to roll in. And I think something sort of integral to, to note here is that we've had, you know, this really bad drought this year. Um, the crop season precipitation was incredibly low, um, basically uh, less than an inch and a half. And so um, the entire research herd has basically been translocated to the uh, NMSU Clayton site, as you guys saw this morning. Um, and, and so fortunately that, that little bit of transhumans has hopefully saved some of our rangeland here in Las Cruces. And uh, yeah, the cover is just, just to show you that we've been collecting this data uh, all along. And so we have sort of baseline data with no grazing for the last few years um, and then uh, grazing data sort of moving forward into this year. And so uh, when the cows were in the pastures earlier this spring, here's a photograph of some of the uh, black grandma dominated sites, which is our uh, primary forage species here in the Chihuahua Desert. And so you can see where some of the animals were grazing. Um, and these areas uh, were monitored very closely over the course of that um, trial period, as you can see. So we went out to um, key uh, grazing areas, areas that we know that the cattle's that the cattle like to uh, graze in because of an abundance of those super palatable forage species. And so at various intervals, we were um, monitoring the stubble height, uh, which is you know, the amount that's actually grazed off of the plant. And here you can see that uh, you know, they're sort of um, varying over time, but sort of decreasing in each circumstance. And as soon as one of the pastures got to our critical height of about eight inches, everything was destocked. Um, and so that's how we were able to maintain uh, sort of a rigorous um, yeah, analysis of, or, you know, uh, stocking rate capacity. And so here's some of the uh, preliminary production data on the, on the cattle side. Uh, basically all summer, uh, myself and, and Andrew were uh, measuring lick, lick tub use per pasture. And so what we found was that the um, Criollo tended to consume less um, high protein supplement, which was being provided to them, uh, both on a per head basis and on a kilogram per kilogram basis. So this has some uh, potential implications for both the uh, breed comparison team and possibly the supply chain uh, options group, 
because there might be some money savings advantages in the Creo here. Uh, we also track their body condition scores through time. And so this is something we can get into later, but you can see that they, they changed uh, possibly in relation to both uh, plant availability and then the animal's own physiological state because all these cows were calving during this time. Um, and then here you can see some of the, some of the first data of its kind, I suppose, um, where we were able to look at the, the calving weights and the cow weights um, between the biotype groups. And so here, for instance, the beginning weights of the animals were different, obviously. Um, so were the end weight changes. Um, but what's sort of interesting is that the percent body weight change was statistically not different. Um, so both, both groups of animals basically gained weight across the course of our grazing study. Um, and of course their average daily gains were different too, just because of those differences in their morphological sizes. And regarding the calves, and here's a couple of the uh, crossbred calves. Um, these were sired by Varangus bulls and uh, our Criollo cows at the College Ranch. And the birth weights were actually fairly similar. They're around 30 kilograms, which I think is fairly typical of, of desert uh, calves and you know beef calves in general. Um, and you can see that uh, there was an advantage in the percent of the cow's um, weight that was that was um, born per calf, where the where the criollo calves were essentially um, birthing larger calves uh, compared to their own body size. Um, here we can see that the calves were weaned at about 180 days, and there was a difference in those weaned in those preliminary weaned calf weights, um, where the where the criollo uh, Brangus crossbred calves were a little bit smaller than the Brangus calves, um, which I think is probably emblematic again of our super horrible drought situation in the Chihuahuan Desert this year. But um, ultimately, what I think is sort of interesting is that the weaning weights of, uh, as percentage of the cows' weights, um, were not different. And so, in both instances, uh, the Brangus and the Criollo cows were able to wean about 40% of their body weight. And this is, I think, also fairly typical of uh, what, what you see in sort of bad drought years where the cow's um, efficiency is, is a little bit um, depressed as opposed to, you know, possibly wetter years where you might have 50% of the uh, cow's body weight being weaned um, in pounds of calves. And so basically all the calves from the College Ranch as well as the Utah site and um, the, the Corte Madera all were sent to um, Clayton earlier in the month. Is that right, Dr. Duff? Um, and so I think you guys have received about 120 calves uh, yes. total. And, yes. and so now, now you guys are sort of taking over um, that end of the spectrum, um, beginning to track the calves weight gains and, and potentially their behavior as well. Um, the LoRaWAN system has been moved up to Clayton be, uh, alongside, you know, the research cows. And so that gives us potential to possibly track the calves as well. And Dr. Sibbles might get more into that um, in the precision ranching uh, updates. But yeah, I think we were uh, successful in collecting a considerable amount of data this year. And here's sort of just an overview of what we did. Thank you, Matt.